From the perspective of the dead, Ouija boards are pretty funny, right? Like, finally, someone invents a device that allows you to contact the people you left behind. And all you gotta do is compel a small group of people to slowly move a planchette to spell out your message, one letter at a time. Divination tech is really overdue for a Steve Jobs or something. Still, what a fascinating device, a sort of console that mediates a conversation between two parties, only one of which is verifiably present in the room. Okay, now put a pin in that thought and think back to 1972. A strange electric cabinet has rolled into the pinball arcade. Every teen who's tried it was blown away. Why? Why were people hyped and amazed by this game? It's certainly not for its realistic graphics. Prior to this, TVs were only for viewing. And suddenly, you can control an entire visual environment? One that's responsively displayed on the screen? This isn't the exciting part of Pong. This is. It's really, really easy to focus on graphics and sounds as demarcations of mind-blowing improvements in video games. Often they are, but that's just a pair of trees in the forest. The difference between a game and a video game is, among other things, a degree of separation. You're not tossing the old pigskin. You're pressing a button connected to a box that runs some calculations and outputs what it would be like to toss the old pigskin. And that box? The one that's forced to calculate an entire visual world for you as you happily feed it inputs? It's always had limitations, and those form the bottleneck for what developers are able to communicate to you. Oh hey, there's that pen from a minute ago. A spirit's message has to be funneled through the letters on a Ouija board. A developer's vision has to be funneled through their target hardware. But developers are smart. They work with what they have. Thankfully, the low fidelity 90s graphics meant we could get away with a lot visually, so it really didn't take a lot of time to put these things in. We sort of had this you get the idea mindset, which allowed us to go from idea to implementation really fast. We'd build something and then put it in front of the player and we'd say, you know, you, you get the idea here. Yeah, look, here's, here's an unburrowing head crab from the sand. And really, it's just a small set of polygons pushing up from the ground, a sound of moving sand, and then spawning a head crab in its place. And then the, the little collection of polygons sinks back into the ground. I mean, it looks not at all convincing in 2023, but you get the idea. It's unburrowing head crabs, and they could appear at any time in the middle of a minefield. So that's how we were working at the time. That was Dario Casali commenting on his work for Half-Life 1. I think he offers a really powerful phrase here. You get the idea. As graphical fidelity increases, the developer has to work harder to make sure that you get the idea. Video games simply can't do everything. They're going to be lower fidelity than reality, so it's important for developers to define the boundaries between what you can and can't do in their simulation. No, you cannot, in fact, go in this direction. Door locked. Don't worry about it. I think a lot of the gee whiz factor of new graphical fidelity is actually new interactive fidelity. Yes, ostensibly, the number of polygons in a soda can has increased, but you didn't used to be able to pick it up. Why would you even want to? What would be the purpose? Maybe it's a tutorial? The developers cluing you in on the kinesthetic rules of their world? Maybe it's building the setting and characters. Don't say this example is both. Shinmu, with a reputation for its massive budget, was a graphical marvel at the time. It included a lot of little moments that, yes, showed off the realistic graphics, but also served to build the environment. Holding items in your hands, removed from the abstraction of inventory menus, is far more intimate than psychokinetically levitating a can in the center of your screen. Actually, come to think of it, where are your hands, Dr. Freeman? You get the idea. Call it vain if you'd like, but when faced with the new medium, humans often want to see portrayals of themselves. <laughs> 
sometimes this is easy. Photography? You just snap. And you've got you. Video games in the 70s though? Well, that's harder. You've got to get abstract. This was only the start though. Tech improved very quickly. It became common to just import old mediums and lean on their strengths. To take those pencil test drawings that we were getting from Disney, we would digitize those and then put them in as sprites in the game. And then we could test it. We could play test it, see what was working, see if the mechanic was working at all, but also see if the animation itself was working. Technically, rendering this image of a human counts as a high fidelity portrayal in a video game medium. The shift to 3D threw a spanner in that. Look, we're right back to where have your hands gone? Actually, no, that's not the right question. The better question is, are your hands important? Video games are fundamentally a conversation between you and the developer of the game. The developers need to focus on the right parts of the conversation to make it compelling and interesting to you. Focusing on Cloud's hands doesn't really add anything to anything. Maybe it checks a cool graphics box somewhere, but who cares? You get the idea. You get the idea. A huge number of details go into creating a character like the G-Man. His eyes glint based on a radiosity calculation of the local illumination. They self-shadow and follow you as you move. He has 40 separate muscles in his face, and his emotions are based on a taxonomy of facial expressions created by Dr. Paul Ekman, a research psychiatrist. The character technology gives us a broad emotional palette to draw upon. So you'll really hate your enemies in Half-Life 2, fear for yourself and your friends, and maybe discover a few new feelings along the way. <laughs> There's a reason face-to-face -face communication is so highly praised by people that want you off their lawn. There's a lot of detail there, and it took a while for 3D tech to stop paving it over. Half-Life 2 added a custom solution that gave animators the tools to convey all sorts of subtle expressions and morph between them at runtime. It offers way more control than, say, changing the facial texture between happy.jpg and alert.jpg. There is a sort of in-between, though. Motion capture is a nice synthesis of capturing reality and recreating reality. It's been around for a while and was immediately praised for its ability to capture the subtle movements that truly sell the physicality of human actors. But step back for a moment. What does that actually do for the developer? What does that do for the player? Or rather, what doors does that open? We started research on it about five years ago. Back then, only research groups were really doing it. This kind of on 3D mesh generation from optical cameras. We thought that there might be some application for what we were doing. And this story is a detective story, so the believability of the actor's performance is key to gameplay. That's one of the key strengths of our system. We can actually see all the subtle features that animation traditional ones just can't do. Notice how these developers saw an emergent technology and wondered how it could be used to build an experience. If you're capturing subtle movement from actors, what doors does that open? Lie detection? Perfect for a detective game. The point isn't that the tech is impressive, the point is that it expands your horizon on what developers can do. The box between your controller and your TV is no longer a planchette on a wood grain table. Does this image instill anything within you? Peter Molyneux has gotten a lot of flack for a lot of things. This one, Project Milo, was presented as a tech demo, or maybe an upcoming game. It was only ever the former. The reaction to this quickly shifted from, wow, cool tech, into, never trust Molyneux. Which is a bit harsh if you ask me. I'd like to walk through this trailer and reframe it a bit. Peter Molyneux appears to be excited about this amazing game, but I'd argue that he's actually excited about the expanded capabilities of that box between the gamer and the TV. Look. That is if you finished your homework. You have finished your school project. You what okay? happened there is that Claire yes. knew Milo so well, she knew when he was worried about yeah. something. The head was down, he wasn't looking at the camera so much, and this is about you meeting a character, a person. The part about Claire knowing Milo so well is kind of hammed up. The real star of the show is the expressiveness on the virtual character. Look at this body language. It's not particularly subtle, but tastefully so. And the ability to render that is kind of exciting, right? Especially for a developer that wants the character to express himself non-verbally. But then look at this part. Oh, great, let's get started then. You've got to put these goggles on. Goggles? 
Put them on like this. Okay. What? Like that? Claire has been thrown a pair of goggles. Notice what she did. This wasn't acted. She felt the need to reach down for those goggles. Now, everybody, every single person that has experienced this reaches down because they feel so connected to Milo's world. Cool. It's really, really easy to zoom into the line. This wasn't acted. And unsheath your pitchfork. But read between the lines. Why is he excited? Because of the players reacting like they're at the 1895 premiere of Arrival of a Train at La Ciotat, then they are immersed. And of course, of, of course the developer would be excited that some new hardware has dissolved the boundaries between the player and the world they so carefully created. It's not about the graphics. It's not about the realism. It's not about the cool tech. It's about the conversation. Game developers want to say something, and the graphics, the realism, the tech, the style, the teraflops and the gigabytes, these are all just tools. Tools that the game developers are forced to use to communicate. The tools have gotten better over time. And when the tech improves, it's exciting because it means there's more tools in the toolkit, not because the tools themselves are inherently cool, even though they kind of are. It's about the conversation. Don't ask, how good are these graphics? Ask, what do these graphics communicate?